Thank you. I'm, uh, I'm excited to talk to you about the uh, ASEMI project, which is uh, basically a collaboration between uh, a group of us at the University of Malta in, uh, in the Department of Communications and Computer Engineering, and uh, Paul and a few other guys here at the SRF. Um, so ASEMI is about the automated segmentation of uh, microtomography imaging. Um, so basically the project itself is funded by ATTRACT, which is an H2020 project. So uh, that's, the, that's the funding context that we're working on. It's been going on for the last few months. And I'll start with a, a brief overview of what the project is about, and then I'll hand over to Mark for uh, details on the machine learning part of things. So once again, we're talking about mummies. Now I'm sure most of you are familiar with what mummies are. So these are basically ancient dead animals that have been mummified, so dried up and wrapped around with textiles and some other things done to them, and then left for a very long time. And one particular animal that we've been looking at quite a lot over the last few months is an ibis, so this is a modern one. But the one that we've actually been looking at is more like this. So this is a scan that uh, Paul and Camille and so on here at the SRF have, have actually done. The one on the left is the actual um, image. The one on the right is simply brightened up because I know that on projectors you don't really get to see the contrast well enough. So this hopefully gives you a slightly better idea. Now, what's, what's the fundamental problem that we're, that we're looking at? What we're trying to do is to automate the labeling process, which is right now basically done manually. So we start with what's on the left, which is the scan. And what we want to end up with is the image on the right, where every separate pixel for every slice, so every voxel effectively, needs to be labeled with what is it? Is it bone marked in red over here? Is it the ceramic jar that uh, simply closes everything in this case? Is it soft tissue? Is it textiles that, that wrap the mummy? Now, why, why do we care about this? The, the whole point of identifying all these is so that well, this is where I would really like to show you something that uh, Camille and Paul produced. And she'll be talking more about this later on. So this is a 3D view that they did. Uh, sorry, this is a video that they did of the uh, 3D scan itself. So right now it's just going through the various layers. And uh, after they did the labeling manually, which took quite a long time, then they could start looking at every, sim every component separately. So this is, this is the whole point. So once, once we're through with that, then you can see it in false color. But more interestingly, you can actually start carving things up. So you can remove virtually the, um, the ceramic. You can start looking at the textiles. You notice that some of them are pretty degraded on the outside. So we can remove those as well. And what remains is the wrappings, the tighter wrappings around the mummy, with some bones protruding in this case. And again, these can be removed. B because everything that is segmented separately can be seen separately. This is, this, is the key, this is the key point behind all this. So once you remove those, you can see the soft tissue. You remove that. You start seeing the bones. And this gives you insight into what's within the mummy so that the archaeologists can start to do their actual work. So all this, in a sense, is just preparatory. And, and this is basically where we come in, because doing this manually takes a very, very, very long time. We're talking at least weeks for something small, months for something like the crocodile that uh, Camille mentioned yesterday. So the whole point of applying machines is that we now want to be able to do all that manually, uh, sorry, automatically. Now, why, why is that? It's not just that we want to make it faster to do a segmentation and therefore study of a single mummy, but there are many, many mummies. Um, you know, Camille mentioned already, for example, that in a particular site, millions of dog mummies have been found. Now, if you want to study one mummy, it's one thing. If you want to study many mummies and start having statistical data on them, then you need to segment many mummies. And there is no way that that can be done manually right now. So automation is key. It's critically important here. So this is, this is the context of where we come in. So at this point, I'd like to hand over to Mark, who will talk to you about the various machine learning approaches that we've tried over the last few months and what we intend to uh, work on 
um, beyond that. So uh, I'm the guy who's doing uh, the actual project on machine learning here. <laughs> and uh, first of all, it's important to point out that we don't use deep learning, even though um, that's what is implied in the program. Um, but we do use machine learning, um, uh, because deep learning is something that we intend to do later. So basically, um, the idea is this. We have these slices, right? And uh, in this particular volume, there are 4,500 slices. And uh, rather than having to label each one of those 4,500 slices, we would instead like to have a sample of slices that a human would label manually, and then the computer would infer from that information how to generalize over the unlabeled slices. So basically, instead of having to label 4,500 slices, you just label six, and then uh, the rest is done automatically, right? And that would be great. So for example, here we see the terracotta, and the human would say, this is what the terracotta is. And that can be drawn either by a pen or something. Um, then you move on to a, few fur, uh, a slice that's further along. And the computer has to guess where the terracotta is. And this is what the computer says. Right? So this is not, a human didn't do this. The computer did, based on the information that it learned from the previous slice. Um, if we see then, for example, something more interesting like bone, right? This is also what the computer thinks is bone, based on what the previous slice it, it found. So, for example, this is here, right? It found that this is a bone. This, it's saying that it's a bone, even though it's an inclusion, but we might forgive it for that. I would imagine that it's a bone as well. Um, textile, uh, sorry, if we compare it to what a human would say, right? this is the manually labeled version of bone. Uh, we, see, we can see that it's actually very similar. Uh, we see textile, so the, uh, the wrapping around the mummy, um, it's confusing a bit of tissue with, um, uh, with textile. So the stuff inside here is the mummy itself. And it seems that there's a lot of similarity between textile and tissue. And so that tends to get confused a bit. Uh, but tissue seems to be very hard to label even for people. Um, so that uh, can be something that we should work on later. And tissue, <coughs> right? So again, uh, some differences that we can see. For example, this is inside a bone. Here it's being considered as tissue, the marrow inside the bone. Uh, here it's considered as part of the bone, right? Now, if we want to quantify that, uh, in terms of numbers, how well it's doing, we can take what the manually labeled part of a bone is, for example, and what the computer is labeling as a bone, and divide the area of the intersection by the area of the union. Right? And that gives you a measure of overlap as a percentage. Uh, if it's 100%, that means that's a perfect fit. And we see that air and terracotta are being uh, labeled very well. Tissues are the, le the, the hardest to label, uh, but in general, it's, it's uh, in fact, uh, Paul was quite happy with it uh, when we sent a segmented volume. So uh, we're, we still have some work to do, but uh, we're quite happy as well. Um, in terms of time, this takes about uh, 46 seconds per slice. Uh, which means that if you want to do all the 4,500 slices, it takes about two and a half days. Um, of course, um, th we have found some bottlenecks. We can make this faster. Um, 
And uh, that is also something we intend to work on um, right after this conference, basically. Right, so how does this work? Uh, as I said, it's not a deep learning method, but it is a machine learning method. So the idea in segmentation is that you want to take each and every one of these pixels and classify them. You want to choose, you want the computer to tell whether it's bone, whether it's tissue, whether it's textile, etc. But it has to be done for each and every pixel. Now, in this particular specimen, we have about 3 million pixels, right? Uh, and so it has to do this one by one for every pixel. And in order to do that, it needs to extract some kind of information about that particular pixel in order to allow the computer to, based on the information about the pixel, um, uh, tell what label it is. And the information would be the neighborhood, we call it, around that pixel. Uh, we use the random forest classifier to do that, which is a uh, quite a common machine learning method. Um, it, we also tried other things like SVMs and uh, logistic regression, but uh, the random forest works best, we found. Um, but you also need to provide manually engineered features, which is the information that describes um, the voxel. And uh, we tried several things like um, SIFT features, which are used in photos, um, local binary patterns, uh, which are used to describe texture in photos as well, and histograms. And uh, that's what we found works um, the fastest and also uh, gives good performance. And the idea is this. Extract a cube around that pixel, right? So extract a cube of voxel intensities around that pixel. And construct this list of numbers. The voxel value, so the amount of the intensity of that voxel that you're classifying, that's very important to include. A histogram of a small neighborhood around the, so a small cube around that voxel. Um, by histogram, I mean the frequencies of different intensities, of ranges of intensities, right, in a cube. And another histogram of a larger neighborhood. So it's like a two levels of detail, right? There's a bird's eye view and there's a more fine-grained view. Um, when you do that and you feed in, so you turn every one of these pixels into such a list of numbers together with the manually um, selected label for the pixel and you feed that to the random forest, um, uh, the random forest will be trained in order to predict what the label should be based on those numbers. And you get, an, and, and this is basically what we did for the, um, for the results that I showed you before. So we used the voxel value, a cube that's three by three by three for the, for the uh, small neighborhood, and a cube for the, and a cube for the um, large neighborhood, which is 41 by 41 by 41 voxels. And you get an 85.2% average intersection over union at a uh, speed of 46 seconds per slice. Um, something else that we tried doing. Something else that we tried doing is to, rather than enlarge the neighborhood, instead we would um, make the volume smaller and then use a small neighborhood in that um, rescaled volume because that is kind of equivalent, right? In, in image processing, this is called uh, an image pyramid. And it would help because rather than having to collect a histogram for a large cube, which takes time, 
you can instead use a small cube in a smaller volume. Um, and if you do that, you save some two seconds. So it's not a lot, but you know, two seconds for a lot of slices that adds up. Um, but you get a reduction in the uh, precision. Um, these are the best 10 uh, combinations that we have found. We've been trying all sorts of different combinations of how these, uh, what works best. And uh, what's important is, so what's interesting is, for example, using a l very large neighborhood does not give you better performance than using a smaller one. Right, so, um, so this means that you can just pick one neighborhood size and apply it to everything. So this uh, will probably mean that you will still need to train it on a specific um, specimens rather than start on one, train on one specimen and then apply it to everything else. Uh, for future work, we intend to make the process faster we intend to create a plugin so that it can be integrated into Dragonfly, um, so that you just press a button. And as I said, uh, we'll be using deep learning um, in the near future. Thank you. OK, thank you. Uh, any questions? Oh. So I noticed that the uh, the hollow bird or I I ibis bones, the interior was also classified as the outside. Yes. Is that because these features are a bit too small relative to your larger environment, or is there a reason why that was the case, or was it just in the example you showed? Um, so you're asking why it filled in the bones? Yes. Um, uh, well, the thing is that, so if you zoom into there, this isn't really hollow. There is a bit of webbing in there, which is from the marrow. Yeah. And, uh, and the computer has approximated that, right? Because it, has, it can't learn a perfect um, a perfect model of what a bone looks like, but it makes these sort of subtle mistakes. And uh, I don't know, I, I'm, we still have to compare these results with, uh, with Paul in order to see what are actual labeling mistakes and uh, what are sort of ambiguous mistakes because even though these were labeled manually, there's still a bit of um, uh, s uh, subjectivity, right? Mm -hmm. No two annotators will say the same thing. Um, if, so if I may add something small. Um, it also depends a lot on how the initial manual segmentation was done. So sometimes yeah. the manual segmentation would simply label the whole thing as a bone. Sometimes, so this, this depends on the person actually doing it. Sometimes they would prefer to clean up any, any internal cavities and remove them from the labeling. In that case, the training that the computer sees is different, and the output will also be different. Now, I would like to add something regarding the segmentation of the skeleton. Basically, the computer made better job than us. So the thing is, most of the errors are coming from the fact that the manual segmentation we made is far from perfect. And for instance, you can see that you have some textile within the body uh, that we were not segmenting during our manual segmentation, but in fact, the computer found some textiles there. And the error in our side, it's not the error of the computer. So the computer made also errors. So it's not perfect. But uh, some of the things come really from uh, errors in the manual segmentation because you can never spend enough time. So you can consider that the, we are giving a good approximation of what it should be, but uh, we are humans, we are missing, missing, making mistakes, and from time to time, we also want to go to sleep. So it's a, 
I would say, uh, yeah, the results were. But that's impressive. because you had to segment the whole volume. If you yeah. just had to segment six slices, you yeah, make less of it. Yeah, but we are not segmenting the full, full volume by hand, slice by slice. We made region growing, we made uh, uh, morphological yes. operations and things like that. So, but again, we do that to have the best possible result in the shortest time. So that's why the masks are never perfect. So in this respect, many things that are considered as error from the computer can be also attributed to error of the humans from the beginning. Um, if, if I may, Paul, uh, also there's certain inconsistencies on what's inside a bone. So is there air? Is there tissue? Right, they look kind of the same. Is it bone? Right, so... It's, it's, uh, it's exactly what I mean. We made some What's mistake inside a bone the is not consistently labeled yeah. either. So the, the data we gave you, you have some bones that have been filled and other ones not. So it's really not the, the fault of the computer, I would say, in this case. Um, if you'll allow me a little practical question. Uh, how um, uh, uh, memory and operation heavy is this? I'm not a computer specialist and I wish I was if I see this exciting work. But can I do this on a... On, on, a, on a home computer that's, or a That's a very um, important question uh, and it's something that we've been struggling with since the beginning of this project. Uh, um, yes, Johan? Short, short answer, I think. Right now, the machines that we're using are fairly conventional workstations, so nothing, nothing fancy at all. We recently bought some larger memory machines, like 256 gigs RAM, that kind of stuff, to, to hopefully make things a bit faster. But to actually make it a lot faster, the best way forward, I think, would be offload much of the work onto the GPU. But in terms of memory, memory is basically the biggest problem here. A single volume is something like 30 gigabytes. So if you want to load all that into memory, that's basically 30 gigs of RAM. And that's just having the copy there, not even doing anything with it. So yeah, mostly memory intensive, I think. Uh, ah, and uh, if we're going to be working on larger volumes, right? because eventually we're going to also be working on human mummies, for example. It's uh, very important that it's fast and also uh, memory friendly. Um, but I, I think 30 gigs is today not an issue. You could get a machine with a terabyte without, any, without a big budget. Yeah? So you could be, yeah, I mean, we, 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 big budget. <laughs> 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 well, we, could, we could provide you one, I'm sure. Okay. Thank you, and thank the speakers again, both of them. and. Just